Hi and welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist on a mission to discover how to age well and look and feel good for longer. And I'm very excited to bring you today's interview because I'm talking to a doctor who's making big waves on YouTube by sharing strictly evidence-based advice around healthy aging and preventative medicine. He is, of course, primary care physician Dr. Brad Stanfield, and it's his commitment to scrutinizing and breaking down the available scientific evidence around different longevity supplements and approaches to aging well that has marked him out. I know many of my subscribers already follow Brad, but just in case you don't yet, I will link to his channel and to his website in the description below so you can find out more about him and his channel is well worth a follow. Also, a reminder from me that you'll find more advice and information around healthy aging and skincare on my website, honest.scot. But for now, let's hear from Dr. Brad Stanfield on what the science actually tells us when it comes to preventative medicine and longevity. Brad, thank you so much for talking to me today. I mean, I know how busy you are with the educational work that you do on YouTube and elsewhere and in your own practice as a primary care physician in New Zealand. Thanks very much. I'm looking forward to our discussion. I know a lot of my viewers watch your channel. They'll be very excited uh, to hear from you today because it does feel like there is a new Wonder Health supplement that's being promoted every week. And uh, it's just so good to have a doctor like you who's pouring over the scientific evidence to give us an unbiased view. So I, I want to start, if I can, just by asking about your interest in the area of preventive medicine. I mean, where did that begin? What, what inspired you to start conducting your own research and sharing it in the way you do so well? Yeah, truth be told, it was when I was a junior doctor in the hospitals and I started noticing little lines um, cropping up by my eyes. And that got me interested in thinking, you know, it's the 21st century. What's happening mm -hmm. about aging? Are we any closer to, you know, strategies to, to solve aging? And that kind of got my journey started. I was always quite interested in supplements because I used to play quite a lot of sport back in the day. So I've, you know, taken creatine and, and protein supplements for a long period of time. Um, and, and I wanted to see, is there anything else that people can do now um, to slow down the aging process? And I didn't know uh, when I was in hospital medicine that I wanted to go into primary care. Um, but the more that I became interested in this field and in preventative medicine, I knew that yeah, primary care was the, was the way to go for me because I wanted to prevent disease rather than to treat it um, and, and to keep people as healthy as possible for as long as possible. So yeah, that, that's a um, brief introduction into my journey. That's how it got started. And I mean, look, the, I said there was like a, a list of supplements as long as my arm, probably longer, that I would I would love to just go through one by one. But we, we're, we're limited um, for time, of course. And one of the biggest topics I know you cover on your channel a lot, there's so much interest in it, is um, the, the idea of boosting our NAD levels and how best to do that. Um, and it seems like there's something of a scientific spat around three supplements, NMN, NR, niacin. And, you know, for the average person like me, it gets very confusing. Um, can you summarize the difference between them and why and how they work differently whilst being related? Yeah, I, I think it's important for people to remember that these are all just different types of vitamin B3. That That's it. They're just vitamin B3. And in, in terms of coming coming back to the question of whether we should be boosting NAD or not, that's still an open question. So there's a human observational study that took muscle biopsies from older adults who exercised, older adults who didn't exercise, and it compared it to muscle biopsies of younger adults. And what they could see is that the older adults who were exercising, their muscle NAD was roughly similar to younger adults. So it, it may just be that through a great diet and regular exercise, our NAD levels will be absolutely fine and that we don't need to do anything about them in terms of adding in supplements. And that's kind of the camp that I sort of fall into. I'm looking at the nicotinamide riboside or NR studies, looking at the NMN or nicotinamide mononucleotide studies in humans. Um, I've, I'm yet to be convinced that there's any true benefit from taking those types of supplements. So um, I, I think the jury's still out, particularly because, again, just through exercise, it seems, we can maintain healthy NAD levels. There are uh, so many scientists around 
trying to hack the system at the moment and and people are interested and you know I mean my parents are you know my mum's 80 my dad's 79 and I've been talking to them about this and now they're taking NMN so it's it's like of personal interest to me because you know when you get to that age obviously you want to do as much as you possibly can and we're hearing so much about it um and I think it's a really good point that you make that just naturally through diet and exercise, these are the things that people kind of think, oh, well, that's a given, that's boring, but, you know, just so important. And that's one of the crucial things that, that I try and emphasize on my channel, that mm -hmm. um, y there's always going to be a new shiny supplement that that crops up. And, and people don't want to hear this, um, yeah. but yeah, there's always going to be a new supplement that crops up, but none of it is going to replace, you know, diet and exercise and sleep, because those are the things that people often don't get right and and that causes health problems in of itself so yeah i think if, if people really want to uh age better um yeah it, it's the trifecta of diet exercise and sleep that really make a difference because am i right in thinking that you used to take nmn so initially you were kind of thinking oh this looks interesting i can get on board with this there's a lot of noise around this and then you stop taking it yeah i it was kind of in my early journey at looking at supplements um and i kind of got swept up in the hype so mm -hmm. I haven't taken NMN supplements for two and a half, three years now. Um, just because w when I took a step back, the reason why I created my medical channel um, is to focus in on what the human clinical research shows. And quite frankly, the human clinical research doesn't support the concept of using NMN or NR supplements at this stage. Um, yeah. if, if there was good evidence, th they would be part of the clinical guidelines that we use in our everyday practice as clinicians, but they're not because the evidence isn't there. You're not ruling, ruling it out as an option completely. There may be something there, but they just haven't evidenced it right yet. Yes, but, but equally the, the initial human studies that I've looked at, um, so say with NMN, there's about, I recently did a video on this of looking at mm. the 12 um, NMN studies so far, and there's no clear benefits. They look at, um, you know, muscle performance. They look at questionnaires in terms of how you're feeling. It's called the um, SF36 questionnaire. They look at cholesterol levels, insulin, and when the studies are placebo controlled, there doesn't seem to be much of a clear benefit with NMN supplements. Mm. Um, and, and particularly if you wind it back, medicine for decades has used what well, used to use niacin. Okay, and and that was to try and lower cholesterol levels. But what they found that um, yes, niacin does reduce cholesterol levels, but it also seems to increase the chances of developing type two diabetes. So it didn't lower um, it, it didn't lower heart attack rates. It didn't have any effect on death rates or cancer or anything like that. So we know a truckload already about vitamin B three. Um, and it looks like that when you take NMN or nicotinamide riboside in, your gut actually converts those molecules into niacin. So it, it again, I'm just not, um, yeah. I'm not particularly excited because we've, you, we've researched vitamin B3 for decades and we haven't seen any benefits. I mean, you have developed uh, your own multivitamin and I think that includes niacin, does it? I mean, can, can you explain your thinking on what, what you included on that? So I wanted to create a low dose multivitamin and mineral to help people reach their recommended daily intakes without mega dosing. No, again, no supplement should replace a great diet, mm -hmm. but often it's quite tricky to get all of your micronutrients every day um, to, to reach those recommended daily intakes. And that's why a lot of people take multivitamins. The trouble is, Many, if not all of the multivitamins on the market today, they have truckloads of um, of dosages. So for example, with vitamin C, the recommended daily intake for males is 90 milligrams, but most supplements will have orders of magnitude greater than that. Mm. So I wanted to create a low dose multivitamin and mineral, again, just to help support a healthy diet and make sure that every day people can reach their uh, recommended daily intakes of those micronutrients. So as part of that, it does include vitamin B3. So it does include niacin. Right. Okay. But that is not specifically aimed at helping people boost NAD levels. That's just for general health. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's just as part, um, yeah, as part of making sure you're reaching all of your uh, recommended daily intakes for all of your micronutrients. You mentioned this earlier, and I, I'm keen to ask you about creating. I mean, I already feel like I rattle with supplements in the morning. And based on this conversation, I might make a few changes, but um, I'm toying with adding 
creatine into my supplement um, aged 50. I see a lot of people, you know, nutritionists in my age bracket saying this is important. I mean, what does it do and why are you convinced of its benefits? Yeah, I think if anyone wanted to explore the world of supplements, creatine has got the, the strongest evidence for it. We know that it helps improve muscle recovery after exercise. It also seems to help improve your performance during short bursts of exercise. Um, and there's some interesting research coming out suggesting that older adults who take creatine, so this was from a meta-analysis in humans, um, that it seems to improve cognitive performance as well. Mm -hmm. And and then in terms of the safety profile, it's been studied, it is probably the most studied supplement uh, in humans. We know a lot about how it works and the safety profile of it. So one of the concerns was, does it damage kidneys? And we've got studies going out five years showing that there's no damage to the kidneys whatsoever with creatine. And, and the list goes on in terms of proving its safety profile. The only um, concerns that, the, the only true side effects that some people get um, is gastrointestinal discomfort. Um, aside from, uh, and some people get bloating. Aside right. from that, it's a very, very well tolerated supplement with, with true measurable benefits. And does it matter when you take creatine? At what time of day? It doesn't appear to. Mm -hmm. So in the human studies that we've got so far, um, it, it seems that so long as your muscles are loaded with creatine, so it takes about, if you take five grams a day of creatine, it, it takes a few weeks for your muscles to become fully saturated with creatine. Um, but but once, that, once your muscles are saturated with creatine, then it doesn't seem to matter when in the day you're taking the supplement, so long as you mm -hmm. are taking the supplement. And is that kind of the recommendation around five five grams? Would that be about right? Yeah, that's what most people do. So if you've okay. never taken creatine before, some people will advocate for loading doses. So taking up to 20 grams of, of creatine a day to, to reach that saturation uh, point in your muscles quicker. But if you do that, yeah, you increase the risk of developing those gastrointestinal symptoms. So most people would just say, look, Five grams a day is absolutely fine. And eventually you will reach your um, saturation point with that dose. Um, I noticed that within your own supplement, you also include TMG, uh, trimethylglycine. Why is that important? Because I that is actually something that I've uh, started introducing recently, but that was more because people talked about taking that alongside NMN to boost its benefits. But it's kind of emerging as actually, <laughs> this is the better one to go for. Yeah, so it, it comes back to the um to the muscle performance aspect of it as well. So there was th there's been a few human studies showing that when you combine TMG with exercise, that offers further muscle performance improvements compared to a placebo. So so that's the main reason why I take it, okay. um, is because of those human trials. There's also another effect. So TMG or trimethylglycine is what we term a methyl donor, um, and that's important. Um, for, to make sure that we're you know, producing our neurotransmitters and, and, and all of those types of things. But crucially, it lowers a thing in the blood called homocysteine. So right. homocysteine, high levels of that, is associated with cardiovascular disease and dementia. Now, the, the jury is still very much out as to whether TMG supplements will lower cardiovascular disease or lower dementia rates. That, that's, that's very controversial because it's not proven. But, mm -hmm. but there is a possible mechanism for how it may have, a, have an effect. But as of today, the primary reason why I take it is for the muscle performance improvements. The benefits of omega-3 are well known. I know you take that as a daily supplement as well. Other important ones, magnesium, zinc, uh, vitamins D3 and vitamins K2. Now, I mean, vitamin D seems to be emerging as something really important. We heard a lot about it over the pandemic. I mean, do you think everybody should be taking uh, a vitamin D supplement? Uh, it, it and I don't want to plug my my low dose multivitamins. <laughs> um, I, I think it's important that you, you know vitamins are named vitamins for a reason. It's because mm -hmm. our body can't produce it by itself. So say with vitamin D, our body can produce it if we're exposed to sunlight. But many of us work indoors; we don't see enough sunlight. So I think it's reasonable to take a low dose of um, vitamin D three and and the rest of the vitamins to make sure that you're reaching your recommended daily intake. The, the trouble is most people don't do that. They mega dose these vitamins. So um, the, uh, the endocrine society, they recommend to take up to 1000 international units of vitamin D a day. And, and mm -hmm. that will be plenty. That's all you need. 
but that that's in in the supplement world that's considered a very low dose but mm-hmm. that's still 125 percent of your recommended daily intake for vitamin d so again i think people just need to be careful about the dosages that they're using with these supplements i think it's fine to help supplement a good diet and healthy exercise and all of that to reach your recommended daily intakes. But it's an entirely separate discussion about mega dosing these things. Cause when you start to mega dose, that's when problems start to occur. Yeah, no, that is a good point. You're making me think twice about that. Okay. There's, there's a couple of supplements, uh, newer ones on the radar or certainly newer ones on the public's radar that have been flagged to me by viewers. Um, that have been quite heavily promoted at the moment. Firstly, uh nitric oxide um is that a supplement that's on your radar for for longevity and health and and if so why um to be honest not particularly (laughs) when it comes to nitrates or or nitric oxide in in clinical medicine we typically think of it to try and um open up blood vessels if people are having a heart attack or or having chest pains from ischemic heart disease that that's sort of the context that that crops to mind for me but in terms of using it as a so-called longevity supplement um I haven't seen anything that that would excite me in in the human research at this point. Okay, that's that's interesting because there there are there's a there's a couple of doctors that are are going big for that at the moment as if it's the new wonder thing. But um, if it hasn't, if lights haven't started flashing on your radar, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it, I think this is another case of it's very easy to to get excited about the new thing um, because you you might see a promising result in mice studies but you know that most mice results don't translate to humans because obviously we're not mice and we're not living in a controlled safe lab we live in the real world where we're exposed to diseases and and the list goes on so um i I think it, it comes back to what i was saying earlier if people really want to improve their health it really is diet, exercise, and sleep. The other thing that I wanted to talk to you about, and I, th- I think that there's probably going to be a similar answer, is urolithin A. Um, I believe it's produced naturally in the gut. It's thought to support mitochondrial health. Again, when you read the promotional materials about it, you think, oh, that must, that's something I've got to go for. <laughs> you know, is the hype around this one justified? Is there, is there anything that could, is there potential in it, do you think? Yeah, it, it's a really interesting molecule from a mechanistic standpoint. So the mitochondria, they're the powerhouses of our cells. So, so they create energy. And as we age, our mitochondria become damaged. So there's this concept called mitophagy, which is where our cells, they gobble up the old mitochondria and produce new ones. And it seems that urolithin A can help promote mitophagy. So, so gobbling up those old damaged mitochondria. Um, so, so it's an interesting mechanism, and it's it's hoped that it may improve muscle performance a, a, alongside a whole host of other things. There's been a number of initial human studies looking at what effect uh, urolithin A will have on muscle, but those studies are still in their infancy. We, we don't have clear benefits yet. Um, if 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 we could see that uh, if a group of people were exercising and one group was taking urolithin A and another group was taking a placebo and we found that the group who were taking the urolithin A could walk further and could lift heavier weights and had stronger grip strength, I, I would be very, very excited. But we, we, we don't have that research yet. It, it may come, um, but I, I don't think I don't think people should necessarily be spending their money on this on this product just yet because the evidence isn't there in my view. No, this is a good conversation because I already feel like I should sort of scale down the number of supplements <laughs> I'm taking every day and and just continue that focus on diet and exercise. And when it comes to diet, I mean that kind of bring that kind of brings me on to another point yeah. because um we've got you know studies going on looking at single supplements. But it's very, very yeah. rare to combine these supplements together. So, um, yeah, I, I think what well, once again, it's very uh, easy to get excited about the new latest thing and and add it to your supplement protocol. Um, being yeah, being in this field for a, a while though, I, I just exercise caution. Yeah, I know because I mean, how how does combining all these things work? We we don't know the impact of one on the other. You're you're a hundred percent right. Um, when it comes to diet, I mean, again, this is an area that you could talk about um, for days, but what's, what's your basic approach? Because, you know, urolithin A, that's aimed at gut health. Gut health is emerging as something that's absolutely crucial. Um, 
what's your own approach to diet? Yeah, so I actually wrote a a roadmap. Um, so it's free on my website that people can have a look at, and I will it, link it goes to it. through. Yeah, cool. Um, but overall, I think one of the crucial things that people often get wrong in their diet is protein. So most people they don't get enough protein intake. And that's a problem because as we age, our muscle starts to decline. So we lose our muscle strength. And there's two key things that we can do to stop that from happening. Resistance exercise and getting enough protein. So ideally, we want to be having about 1.6 grams of protein intake per kilogram of body weight per day. So for an 80 kilogram person, that's about 100 and well, it's 128 grams, I think, of, of protein mm-hmm. intake. Mm-hmm. Now that's a truckload, right? So um, beef, if you had a hundred grams of beef, that's only 25 grams of protein. So you'd be having about 600 grams of beef to reach that recommended daily intake. Now I'm absolutely not suggesting that you should go out and do that. I'm just trying to Mm -hmm. use that as an illustrative point that again, most people aren't getting or reaching those, uh, protein targets. So every meal people need to be thinking, where is my protein coming from? So often patients that I see at the clinic, they'll have, maybe some cereal uh, for breakfast and then they'll go to work. But often that cereal is just straight carbohydrates. It's got no protein in it whatsoever. So you need to be thinking, you know, do I need to be adding some sort of a protein powder to my, my oatmeal in the morning? Do I need to be having eggs? Or the list goes on. People need to be focusing in on that protein and specifically lean protein intake. So um, ideally we, we want to be having things like fish, beans, nuts, seeds, lentils, chickpeas, th- those types of um, of proteins. And then when it comes to carbohydrates, carbohydrates have got a bit of a dirty name at the moment because of the ketogenic diet, which is unfortunate because um, the, the ketogenic diet gets it correct in that we should be throwing out you know, biscuits and chips and, mm-hmm. and donuts and those types of things. Mm-hmm. But it's unfortunate that there's been a bit of a war against you know, vegetables and fruits and oatmeal, because those are overwhelmingly brilliant for the for the human body. So those are the type of carbohydrates that you want. And then when it comes to fats, again, there's been a lot of confusion. And I, I, I don't like to keep blaming one group, but generally the, the carnivore and, and ketogenic community will say, you know, saturated fats are great. Animal fats are brilliant. We want to be having lots of butter. Overwhelmingly, we've got truckloads of research showing that that's a bad idea for our cardiovascular health. And and this, this is why the clinical guidelines around the world say we should be lowering our saturated fat and increasing our unsaturated fat. So, you know, our olive oils, our fish, mm. um, avocados, those types of foods. So, um, yeah, that, that would be my sort of general basis for designing a, um, a diet that can kind of be applied to many different tastes and preferences. Because that's the other crucial thing is that people need to find a diet that will work for them. But so long as you're focusing in on those fundamentals of health, you can adjust those to to your own preference and, and make a diet that works for you. I have added in just, just finally um, collagen powder and hyaluronic acid. I noticed that those are two that you take yourself, do you? Those two? Yeah. yeah. On the, the collagen, um, okay, obviously, you know, we take that for our skin, um, but good good for bone health as well would you say collagen powder the research seems to be relatively strong for skin um but collagen peptide supplements that they are surrounded with controversy mm. because um the, the collagen peptides all they are are short chains of amino acids right mm-hmm. so amino acids make up proteins so critics of um collagen will say well you can get all of the benefits if you just had enough protein mm-hmm. um the, the caveat to that is a well, one particular human study where they gave, uh, so it was in burn patients just to have a look at the healing rates of wounds. And they gave half of the burn patients um, uh, soy protein, I think it was 36 grams per day. And they gave um, the other half collagen peptides, 35 grams a day. And they could see after you know a two week period that the group that were taking the collagen peptides, they had a significantly faster wound healing rate. So to me, it does seem that there are other additional benefits to taking collagen peptides beyond protein. Um, and and then in the human clinical studies, looking at things like wrinkles um, and skin hydration, we can see about a, an eight to ten percent improvement um, above a placebo for our you know skin wrinkles and skin hydration. So. 
for the, you know, those are the reasons why I take collagen. I think the evidence is relatively robust and it is safe. Well, listen, just a lot of fantastic, uh, sensible advice there. Thank you so much for your time. I hugely appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. It was a fun discussion. Well, I found that interview to be a very helpful reminder that it's so easy to get carried away with hype around particular supplements and also to be dazzled by claims from scientists and doctors who've formed a very strong view around a particular approach or supplement. And I'm guilty of getting caught up in the hype myself around supplements that offer promise of regeneration, increased energy and so on, exactly because I'm on a journey of discovery. So I've been taking NMN as an NAD booster since the start of the year as have my mum and dad. I did promise to do a video update on our experience which I will share in the next couple of months but I'll tell you the reason I haven't filmed that yet and it's because we had taken blood tests to check our NAD levels at different points and we've had some weird results which we're now trying to double check before I report back properly. But as far as longevity supplements in general go, as Dr. Brad Stanfield said, there are no proven miracle pills out there right now. So it's still a case of watching this space and focusing on a healthy, active lifestyle. Let me know what you thought of our discussion today. I do always love to hear what works for you. So share your thoughts and experiences in the comments. For now, thanks for watching and listening, and I'll see you next time.